Chapter Fifteen, Part Two of A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life by William Law. Chapter Fifteen, Part Two. Chapter Fifteen, of Chanting or Singing of Psalms in Our Private Devotions of the excellency and benefit of this kind of devotion, of the great effects it hath upon our hearts, of the means of performing it in the best manner. Part 2 A dull, uneasy, complaining spirit, which is sometimes the spirit of those that seem most careful of religion, is yet, of all tempers, the most contrary to religion, for it disowns that God whom it pretends to adore. For he sufficiently disowns God, who does not adore him as a being of infinite goodness. If a man does not believe that all the world is as God's family, where nothing happens by chance, but all is guided and directed by the care and providence of a being that is all love and goodness to all his creatures, if a man does not believe this from his heart, he cannot be said truly to believe in God. And yet he that has this faith has faith enough to overcome the world and always be thankful to God. For he that believes that everything happens to him for the best cannot possibly complain for the want of something that is better. If, therefore, you live in murmurings and complaints, accusing all the accidents of life, it is not because you are a weak, infirm creature, but it is because you want the first principle of religion, a right belief in God. For as thankfulness is an express acknowledgment of the goodness of God towards you, so repinings and complaints are as plain accusations of God's want of goodness towards you. On the other hand, would you know who is the greatest saint in the world? It is not he who prays most, or fasts most. It is not he who gives most alms, or is most eminent for temperance, chastity, or justice. But it is he who is always thankful to God, who wills everything that God willeth, who receives everything as an instance of God's goodness and has a heart always ready to praise God for it. All prayer and devotion, fastings and repentance, meditation and retirement, all sacraments and ordinances are but so many means to render the soul thus divine and conformable to the will of God and to fill it with thankfulness and praise for everything that comes from God. This is the perfection of all virtues and all virtues that do not tend to it or proceed from it are but so many false ornaments of a soul not converted unto God. You need not, therefore, now wonder that I lay so much stress upon singing a psalm at all your devotions, since you see it is to form your spirit to such joy and thankfulness to God as is the highest perfection of a divine and holy life. If any one would tell you the shortest, surest way to all happiness, and all perfection, he must tell you to make a rule to yourself, to thank and praise God for everything that happens to you. For it is certain that whatever seeming calamity happens to you, if you thank and praise God for it, you turn it into a blessing. Could you therefore work miracles? Could you not do more for yourself than by this thankful spirit? For it heals with a word speaking, and turns all that it touches into happiness." If, therefore, you would be so true to your eternal interest as to propose this thankfulness as the end of all your religion, if you would but settle in your mind that this was the state that you were to aim at by all your devotions, you would then have something plain and visible to walk by in all your actions. You would then easily see the effect of your virtues and might safely judge of your improvement in piety. For so long as you renounce all selfish tempers, and motions of your own will, and seek for no other happiness but in the thankful reception of everything that happens to you, so far you may be safely reckoned to have advanced in piety. And although this be the highest temper that you can aim at, though it be the noblest sacrifice that the greatest saint can offer unto God, yet it is not tied to any time or place or great occasion, but is always in your power and may be the exercise of every day. For the common events of every day are sufficient to discover and exercise this temper, 
and may plainly show you how far you are governed in all your actions by this thankful spirit. And for this reason I exhort you to this method in your devotion, that every day may be a day of thanksgiving, and that the spirit of murmur and discontent may be unable to enter into the heart which is so often employed in singing the praises of God. It may, perhaps, after all, be objected, that although the great benefit and excellent effects of this practice are very apparent, yet it seems not altogether so fit for private devotions, since it can hardly be performed without making our devotions public to other people, and seems also liable to charge of sounding a trumpet at our prayers. It is therefore answered, First, that great numbers of people have it in their power to be as private as they please. Such persons, therefore, are excluded from this excuse, which, however it may be so to others, is none to them. Therefore, let us take the benefit of this excellent devotion. Secondly, numbers of people are, by the necessity of their state, as servants, apprentices, prisoners, and families in small houses, forced to be continually in the presence or sight of somebody or other. Now, are such persons to neglect their prayers because they cannot pray without being seen? Are they not rather obliged to be more exact in them that others may not be witnesses of their neglect and so corrupted by their example? Now what is here said of devotion may surely be said of this chanting a psalm, which is only a part of devotion. The rule is this. Do not pray that you may be seen of men, but if your confinement obliges you to be always in the sight of others, be more afraid of being seen to neglect than of being seen to have recourse to prayer. Thirdly, the short of the matter is this. Either people can use such privacy in this practice as to have no hearers, or they cannot. If they can, then this objection vanishes as to them, and if they cannot, they should consider their confinement and the necessities of their state as the confinement of a prison and then they have an excellent pattern to follow. They may imitate St. Paul and Silas, who sang praises to God in prison, though we are expressly told that the prisoners heard them. They therefore did not refrain from this kind of devotion for fear of being heard by others. If, therefore, any one is in the same necessity, either in prison or out of prison, what can he do better than follow this example? I cannot pass by this place of Scripture without desiring the pious reader to observe how strongly we are here called upon to this use of psalms, and what a mighty recommendation of it the practice of these two great saints is. In this their great distress, in prison, in chains, under the soreness of stripes, in the horror of the night, the divinest, holiest thing they could do was to sing praises unto God. And shall we, after this, need any exhortation to this holy practice? Shall we let the day pass without such thanksgiving as they would not neglect in the night? Shall a prison, chains, and darkness furnish them with songs of praise, and shall we have no singing in our closets? Farther, let it also be observed that while these two holy men were thus employed in the most exalted part of devotion, doing that on earth, which angels do in heaven, the foundations of the prison were shaken, all the doors were opened, and every one's bands were loosed. Acts chapter 16 verse 26. And shall we now ask for motives to this divine exercise, when, instead of arguments, we have here such miracles to convince us of its mighty power with God? Could God, by a voice from heaven, more expressly call us to these songs of praise than by thus showing us how he hears, delivers, and rewards those that use them. But this, by the way, I now return to the objection in hand, and answer fourthly, that the privacy of our prayers is not destroyed by our having, but by our seeking witnesses of them. If, therefore, nobody hears you but those you cannot separate yourself from, you are as much in secret, and your Father who seeth in secret will as truly reward your secrecy, as if you were seen by him only. Fifthly, private prayer, as it is opposed to prayer in public, does not suppose that no one is to have any witness of it. For husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, parents and children, masters and servants, tutors and pupils, 
are to be witnesses to one another of such devotion, as may truly and properly be called private. It is far from being a duty to conceal such devotion from such near relations. In all these cases, therefore, where such relations sometimes pray together in private and sometimes apart by themselves, the chanting of a psalm can have nothing objected against it. Our blessed Lord commands us, when we fast, to anoint our heads and wash our faces, that we appear not unto men to fast, but unto our Father which is in secret. But this only means that we must not make public ostentation to the world of our fasting. For if no one was to fast in private, or could be said to fast in private, but he that had no witnesses of it, no one could keep a private fast, but he that lived by himself, for every family must know who fast in it. Therefore the privacy of fasting does not suppose such a privacy as excludes everybody from knowing it, but such a privacy as does not seek to be known abroad. Cornelius, the devout centurion, of whom Scripture saith that he gave much and prayed to God alway, saith unto St. Peter, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour. Acts chapter 2 verse 2. Now that this fasting was sufficiently private and acceptable to God, appears from the vision of an angel, with which the holy man was blessed at that time. But that it was not so private as to be entirely unknown to others, appears, as from the relation of it here, so from what is said in another place, that he called two of his household servants, and a devout soldier of them that waited upon him continually. Verse 7 so that Cornelius's fasting was so far from being unknown to his family that the soldiers and they of his household were made devout themselves by continually waiting upon him, that is, by seeing and partaking of his good works. The whole of the matter is this. Great part of the world can be as private as they please. Therefore, let them use this excellent devotion between God and themselves. As therefore the privacy or excellency of fasting is not destroyed by being known to some particular persons, neither would the privacy or excellency of your devotions be hurt, though by chanting a psalm you should be heard by some of your family. Another great part of the world must and ought to have witnesses of several of their devotions. Let them therefore not neglect the use of a psalm at such times, as it ought to be known to those with whom they live that they do not neglect their prayers. For surely there can be no harm in being known to be singing a psalm at such times as it ought to be known that you are at your prayers. And if, at other times, you desire to be in such secrecy at your devotions as to have nobody suspect it, and for that reason forbear your psalm, I have nothing to object against it, provided that at the known hours of prayer you never omit this practice. For who would not be often doing that in the day? which St. Paul and Silas would not neglect in the middle of the night. And if, when you are thus singing, it should come into your head how the prison shaked and the doors opened when St. Paul sang, it would do your devotion no harm. Lastly, seeing our imaginations have great power over our hearts and can mightily affect us with their representations, it would be of great use to you if, at the beginning of your devotions, you were to imagine to yourself some such representations as might heat and warm your heart into a temper suitable to those prayers that you are then about to offer unto God. As thus, before you begin your psalm of praise and rejoicing in God, make this use of your imagination. Be still, and imagine to yourself that you saw the heavens open, and the glorious choirs of cherubims and seraphims around the throne of God, Imagine that you hear the music of those angelic voices, that cease not day and night to sing the glories of him that is, and was, and is to come. Help your imagination with such passages of Scripture as these. I beheld, and, lo, in heaven a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And they cried out with a loud voice, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne 
and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and strength, be unto God, for ever and ever. Amen. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 12. Think upon this till your imagination has carried you above the clouds, till it has placed you amongst those heavenly beings, and made you long to bear a part in their eternal music. If you will but use yourself to this method, and let your imagination dwell upon such representations as these, you will soon find it to be an excellent means of raising the spirit of devotion within you. Always, therefore, begin your psalm, or song of praise, with these imaginations, and at every verse of it imagine yourself amongst those heavenly companions that your voice is added to theirs, and that angels join with you, and you with them, and that you, with a poor and low voice, are singing that on earth which they are singing in heaven. Again, sometimes imagine that you have been one of those that joined with our blessed Savior when he sang a hymn. Strive to imagine yourself with what majesty he looked. Fancy that you had stood close by him, surrounded with his glory. Think how your heart would have been inflamed, what ecstasies of joy you would have then felt when singing with the Son of God. Think again and again with what joy and devotion you would then have sung had this really been your happy state, and what a punishment you should have thought it to have been then silent. And let this teach you how to be affected with psalms and hymns of thanksgiving. Again, sometimes imagine to yourself that you saw holy David with his hands upon his harp and his eyes fixed upon heaven, calling in transport upon all the creation, sun and moon, light and darkness, day and night, men and angels, to join with his rapturous soul in praising the Lord of heaven. Dwell upon this imagination till you think you are singing with this divine musician, and let such a companion teach you to exalt your heart unto God in the following psalm, which you may use constantly first in the morning. Psalm 145 I will magnify thee, O God my King, and I will praise thy name for ever and ever, etc. These following psalms, as the 34th, 96th, 103rd, 111th, 146th, 147th, are such as wonderfully set forth the glory of God, and therefore you may keep to any one of them at any particular hour as you like, or you may take the finest parts of any psalms, and so adding them together may make them fitter for your own devotion. End of chapter 15, part 2 Recording by Marianne Spiegel